Now, from the Pearl Stable Hall, the future of Social Security, presented by AARP and KSAT 12. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. We hope that when you leave today's discussion, you're going to have a clear understanding here of two things. One, the importance of Social Security for millions of Texans, and two, the fact that you can get involved and have a role in keeping this program solvent. We all know that Social Security affects everybody directly or indirectly. Even if you're not a beneficiary, chances are one of your family members is. The money that they receive allows them to have some kind of independence, some kind of security, and in turn, that eases the burden on their loved ones who themselves may also be struggling. So you may have heard that four and a half million people receive Social Security benefits in Texas. I'll break down the numbers for you. Of those, 3.2 million are retired workers. Close to 500,000 others get Social Security disability income. Another half million have lost their spouses. And another 300,000 are children who have lost a parent. They're why we're here. You're why we're here. Now, for our viewers, throughout this discussion, you're going to see a QR code on the bottom of your screen, and it'll direct you to a website where you can learn more about Social Security and how you can get Congress to take action and keep Social Security fully funded. Now, let's talk. So we're here to discuss solutions, but first, before we get into that, we need to understand the challenges. And Dr. Jansen, I'll start with you on that. Last month, the public was bombarded with headlines. I'm sure that many of you saw it, headline after headline, uh, saying the Social Security Board of Trustees released its annual report, saying that if Congress does nothing to shore up Social Security's finances, by 2035, people are going to see a 20, a 17% 17 cut in benefits. So let me give you the numbers on that. That means if you're receiving $1,500 a month in benefits and you see a 17% cut, you're going to wind up getting something like $1,245. So that's a significant cut. All right, so that has to do with Social Security's trust fund. That's what we're talking about here. Why has that been depleted? Right, so Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system, and we collect a payroll tax, the Social Security tax, and we mostly take that revenue and send it off to beneficiaries. But when we collect extra payroll taxes, we put it in the trust fund. And the, uh, the trust fund is like a, you can think of it as a savings account. So it accumulates some savings. And it, when there's times when Social Security benefits take up or cost more than the, than the collected tax revenue, then the trust fund gets drained. We're unfortunately, I guess, in a situation where for the foreseeable future, tax collections from the Social Security payroll tax are insufficient to pay beneficiaries. And so we're drawing down the trust fund, and we're going to be, continue to draw down the trust fund, and we can, we can see that until about 2034 or 2035, at which point the trust fund hits zero, and under current law, Social Security can only pay benefits equal to what's available from the incoming payroll taxes. There's no trust fund to draw on, and that's the cut that you talked about. Right, that's for, but a significant, the, a majority of the money that we get is from current workers. That's correct. Who are paying into the program. It's a pay-as-you-go. Right, this is the pay-as-you-go system. Uh, Dr. Sines, we know Social Security depends on a strong workforce, and the government needs young workers. Technically, the government considers you to be a young worker if you're 46 or under. In that case, Texas is in a good spot. We're the second youngest state. In the country, the median age in Texas is 35. Nationally, it's 39. So let's specifically talk about demographics here, since that's your specialty. How does age specifically play into the overall financial health of Texans and the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, again, the, the major issue that is the challenge that we have. And even though Texas is the second youngest state, these are individuals who are providing for the entire country for the older population as well. And what we've seen then is that, obviously, we had the baby boomers that were born in 1946 to 1964, that they entered the uh, 65 and older category. So you have a massive uh, group of individuals. The last group will uh, reach uh, age 65 in 2029. At the same time, we have seen fertility levels go down uh, quite a bit, particularly at the time of the recession in 2008, we saw fertility plummet tremendously in, uh, in this country. 
And what we have is already uh, the individuals who are less than 25 years of age, they continue to decline in numbers every year and will decline into the future. And the population 18 to 64, which is traditionally the, the, uh, the workforce, what we're going to see is their numbers are also going to decline between 2050 and 2055. At the same time, we, we're going to see a tremendous increase in the older segment of the population. For example, today, 2022, 17% of persons in the country were 65 and older. By 2050, that'll be at 23. By the time we're talking about Census Bureau projections, 2100, we're talking about 30% or so. And then the um, uh, demographers use what is called a dependency ratio. One of those is the aged dependency ratio. That is individuals 65 and older for every 100 workers, 18 to 64. And right now, it's about 29. So each 100 workers has provides for 29 older individuals. By 2050, that'll go up to 39. So you can see the challenges. And also, one of the other points, of course, with longevity, life expectancy, is we know that the uh, percentage of people who are 65 and older who reach age 85 will double also from 11% now to about 21% in the, in the coming years. So that these are not, the solutions that with the, uh, eventually Congress comes up with are not going to be little uh, Band-Aids or anything like this because uh, the, the aging of the population will become even more dramatic in, uh, in the, uh, the, the rest of the decade of, uh, decades of, the, of this century. Yeah, and we also discussed earlier that part of the other issue is that you have, uh, the government says that you, you're supposed to be at the prime of your, of your wages, earning wages, when you're in your 30s and 40s, up until you're 44. Yep. But we all know uh, yet people around that age or maybe even in their early 30s who are still living at home with their parents because their jobs don't pay that much. So that's also another issue to consider yeah. as we move forward. Okay, so we're going to stay on the same topic, Ms. Bono. <coughs> Your organization, Every Texan, which I recommend everybody look up because you guys do great work. Uh, it focuses on advancing equity for all Texans when it comes to financial security, education, health care, jobs. You see the need that a lot of families in our state have. Could you talk about that need and also how Social Security helps them? Absolutely, thank you for that. Every Texan works directly with organizations like the AARP and smaller community groups like grandparents raising grandchildren to help support public education efforts and advocacy at both the federal level and the statewide level. We also work directly with enrollers, uh, folks who help populations like the senior population access benefits that they need to help them thrive. And I think when we're talking about programs like Social Security, we have to think about it in a broader context than just that program alone. Uh, Dr. Sines is absolutely right. It's a numbers game, but it's also a systems game. And the seniors in Texas, especially seniors on a fixed income, are really facing a, a, a complicated web of economic challenges right now. From the seniors that we work with, the top of the list is rising housing costs. I think everyone in this room has experienced the dramatic increase in property taxes and also the cost of rent. Texas has been impacted especially hard by that growth. And so according to a, a study from the Harvard Joint Center on Housing Studies last year, about 30% of seniors in Texas are cost burdened, meaning they spend more than 30% of their income on housing. And we see a similar trend when it comes to health care costs. About 60% of seniors uh, in Texas um, do not have even $500 saved for emergency medical expenses. Food security is another big one. It's the one we hear about a lot. 10% of seniors on fixed incomes in Texas are food insecure. They do not have regular access to nutritious food, and that's above the national average, and it's slowly increasing over time. And so when we think about programs like Social Security that are supposed to provide stability for our aging population, we know that that demographic is going to be growing exponentially over time. Uh, we really need to think about comprehensive solutions to make sure that this population is properly supported in our state. 
let's talk about solutions. Let's roll up our sleeves, right? This is the good stuff, what we came here for. Um, Dr. Jansen, you've written extensively about this. You have urged Congress to act quickly to keep Social Security solvent. I don't think they got the memo. Now, on that topic, people have proposed a few things. One of them is raising the retirement age. People don't like that. <laughs> or lifting the cap on, payroll, on the payroll tax, which would make the highest earners pay more. The current uh, payroll tax is capped at $168,600. So that would mean someone making $200,000 would presumably uh, pay more uh, on their taxes. Which of these solutions makes sense? <laughs> All right. So to, to keep, we're going to have to raise revenue, which means raising taxes. And I think pretty much we must face the fact that we're going to have some benefit cuts. I mean, if we just cut benefits, it's, it's almost a 20% cut to make Social Security solvent. That sounds ridiculous. If it's just raising taxes, we're going to raise taxes by about 25%. Um, one other thing I think we should keep in mind, um, I teach a class on pension economics, and I talk to a bunch of uh, college-age students and then talk about pensions, and we talk about fixing the problem by cutting benefits or raising taxes. And, and those students know that raising taxes means raising their taxes. They don't really think about the fact that when we say cutting benefits, we're probably saying cutting their benefits because we're not going to cut the benefits of current retirees because people think that's ridiculous, and it is. You can't hardly change your economic situation when you're 70 years old and you've been retired for five years, right? So there's a lot of constraints on the different issues. Um, I think one way to think about solving this problem or addressing this problem is to think that, that A, we'd like a solution that really fixes the problem, at least for the next 75 years or so. Let's, let's have a, a solution that we think will fix the problem so we don't have this uh, meeting every, every uh, couple years like we've been doing. Maybe we'd like to fix the problem by making some treating generations somehow um, not equally, of course, because we're going to have to treat retired people differently, but having some intergenerational burden sharing. Um, and finally, I think we have to protect the, the most vulnerable parts of the population. And so one set of solutions that does some of that, or actually could do all of it, is to index the retirement age. We, we have increasing longevity, and we've raised the retirement age from 65 to 67. And nobody likes working when you're 65, but, and nobody likes working when you're 67. And, and that's what your grandkids are going to be doing if we don't change the law. And I'm proposing we change it and, and index it to longevity so your grandkids are going to work more than to age 67. Um, I also think we should raise the, uh, the taxable max. The taxable max is at a, a pretty high level, but it only covers 83% of payroll earnings, according to Social Security. Back in 1983, the taxable max covered 90%. And so we could raise the taxable max to maybe cover 90% of all payroll earnings, right? So you're still exempting the uh, NBA players and stuff at, after they get to, after they get to 200,000, but you're raising the taxable max. And that, that would generate uh, a fair amount of revenue. Um, we could also adjust the benefit formula. So Social Security, uh, it's got a flat payroll tax, but a highly progressive benefit payout. And so there's these, it's, it's a little complicated, but basically Social Security figures your primary uh, insurance amount. It's a dollar figure. And your, your monthly payments are based on your primary insurance amount. And there's ranges. And so for the first range, they call it a bend point, but for the first range from zero to X, you get 90% of your primary insurance amount in your Social Security benefit each month. I mean, well, you get one twelfth of it. But, and then for, over the next range, you get 30%. And over the final range, you get 15%. And so one proposal is to don't change that 90% at the bottom, but that top 15%, add another category and change the 15% to 10 and add a category at the, you know, half of that, for at, you, 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 give, you pay out 10%, and the last half you pay out 5%. So you're reducing the payments to high-income high individuals. Means not, testing. You're, it is, well, it's currently mean tested. It's adjusting the means testing. Sure, but it would be a new system, and a lot of the criticism for that would be that 
uh, it would become political, and then you would call it welfare. Well, I'd say all of it. Well, I'd say all of it's political. Sure. Uh, the, the one last thing, and I'll be quick about this, is we should also, in, in my opinion, we should adjust the cost of living adjustments. The cost of living adjustments are quite popular because everybody pays for the inflation and then you'd like to at least get the cost of living adjustment. But it's based on something called the CPI for wage earners. And economists will tell you that the CPI is not the ideal index anyhow, and the Federal Reserve System agrees they prefer the PCE index. But the CPI has a chained uh, price index, and it would end up meaning that it would probably, on average, cut the inflation adjustment about uh, a tenth of a percent every year. But that actually adds up over time and would, would make a big difference. If you do these four things, and that's just four possibilities, you would actually end up making Social Security you know, solvent at least over the next 75 years. One of the other proposals has also been uh, having a tax on other forms of income, not just salary, but you could. people have talked about bonuses. Most of us don't get those. Um, <laughs> Uh, taxing bonuses and or, or taxing bonuses at, at a higher rate since that's not a salary. Right. So that's a proposal that I I haven't um, seen analyzed myself. Mm -hmm. But um, sure, there's there's many proposals out there, um, and I've only given you a flavor for some of them. So this is a, a question for all <coughs> of you. It seems that the only way Congress is going to act on this is if voters demand it, which is why many of us are here today. The thing is that Social Security is incorrectly perceived as an old person's issue. Uh, when I was doing research for this, I walked around here at the Pearl, and uh, the younger people were, the less they knew or understood Social Security. Uh, it's just not something that is on their radar. How do we change that so that this is a, a problem or a concern, a challenge for all Americans? Certainly events like this, uh, your TV station, KSAT, uh, the AARP in San Antonio. I mean, <clears throat> this event, I guess, is one of the ways that, that, that you change this. I mean, you, you do want people to be more informed, um, and you do want um, there to be pressure on our politicians, our elected officials, because they, it's a difficult issue. They don't want to address it. They would like to kick the can down the road, as the saying goes. Um, and it's perhaps understandable. But a lot of our options for re reform or of the Social Security system, they shrink as you get closer and closer to the day that, you know, think about having this conversation in 2033 and the trust fund's going to ex expire the next year or two. Um, it's going to be a, a lot more difficult task in 2033 than it is today. Now let's get back to uh, Ms. Vono. So you speak to Texans of all ages. You're familiar with the need that people have. How do you get younger people to understand that this is also an issue that affects them directly or indirectly now or definitely will in the future? Well, I absolutely agree. Public education is really what fuels public appetite for change. And for the younger generation, <coughs> So Social Security has been framed as a program that only benefits the elderly. Simply not true. Also benefits folks who are disabled, um, the survivors of deceased workers. And it's also a critical tool for poverty reduction. This is a program that lifts millions of Americans out of poverty. And what happens when we do that? It means that people are less reliant on uh, public benefits on government assistance. It means people are better able to contribute to our, our tax base. They're contributing more as consumers. And that's something that benefits all of us. I mentioned it earlier when our older generation is, is more self-reliant, um, self-sufficient. Um, we as a younger generation then can focus investments on our families, on our children, the future generations. So this really is a case where that rising tide lifts all boats. And uh, I think getting 
the word out, um, not just through the AARP, but even through organizations that serve the youth movement and serve the younger generations. There are a lot of those statewide organizations right now and thinking about how to strategically build those partnerships. I think that's the next wave um, for thinking about how to frame this issue publicly in a way that creates that appetite for change that's impossible for lawmakers to ignore. Dr. Um, Symes, who's gonna be hurt the most? If let's just say it's 2035 right now, all right, we, we, it, we see a 17% cut when it comes to social security benefits. Who's hurt mm -hmm. the most? Yep. And it's uh, people who are uh, poor and people of color are going to be the, the major, are going to bear the, the brunt of that, uh, that cut. And as I've indicated, you have the poverty rates already 125% or lower, uh, where about uh, more than one out of every five persons of color, uh, Latino, African American, uh, Amer American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, we're talking about one out of every five individuals being in poverty compared to about 10% for the uh, white population. And then among women, women in particular have higher poverty rates as well. With women, it's more than one out of every four compared to about 13% of white women. So it's really that the, the race, uh, the racial categories of uh, people of color and women uh, as, uh, as well. And these are individuals also that do not have other sources like uh, um, investments, for example, that are, they're less likely to have investment returns, less likely to have 401ks, IRAs, and so forth that they could possibly uh, help uh, uh, alleviate the, the, the situation. Uh, so, so those are, are the, the big issues. And, and then you also have, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for these individuals, they would also be tapping into the resources of assistance from other family members who themselves are also, in many cases, also dealing with uh, economic kind of issues as well. People came here today for solutions. They want to know when they step out of here, what, what do I do? What's my part in, in this fight to keep Social Security solvent? So I'll start with you, Dr. Jansen, because you've seen the other side of it. You've seen all, all of the challenges that we could be facing down the road. What do you recommend people do? Well, I mean, these seem like simple um, suggestions. I mean, be informed, talk to other people that aren't here today. Um, you have to, we, we mentioned earlier that you, you'd like a, a broad movement that brings some sort of pressure on our elected officials. That movement has to start with you, I guess, and, 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 and us. And so talk to people you know about this. Uh, make it a part of conversation. Don't let it be hidden. Don't let those young people think they don't know what Social Security is. Ms. Bono, you understand what it takes to get people together to advocate. You're in Austin, right? Just sort of a mini version of, uh, of D.C. in some ways. So again, I'll, I'll ask you that question. What do you think it is, uh, what, do, what would you advise people here to do and people who are watching um, to keep this program solvent? No, narratives are so important and raising um, personal and family narratives to help improve the understanding of lawmakers that the, the struggles that Texas families are facing um, and older Texans are facing. Um, we, at Every Texan, we really like to bring the in communities who are most impacted into the Capitol to Austin um, to tell their stories because we think that's way more than compelling than spitting out numbers and statistics like I've been doing mostly today. Um, we worked with a group of grandparent kid um, caregivers, uh, grandparents raising grandchildren last year. We helped train them in advocacy. They went to the Capitol, they met with lawmakers, and lo and behold, a bill that was stuck to create better access to SNAP benefits all of a sudden the next day moved. I don't think that was a coincidence because let's face it, it's hard to say no to grandparents. And so I think there's real power in that. EveryTexan.org, sign up for our listserv. We have action alerts and we send out requests for those narratives during session, which is coming up next year. Um, would love to think about how to partner um, with you personally, but also with local groups who are really in the trenches at the local level. 
Dr. Sines, what's the one thing that most of us do have in common? You, you, you uh, study sociology, you study demographics. What's the one thing that can pull us all together where we can say, all right, I don't care if you're a Republican, I don't care if you're a Democrat, an independent, this is, what, this is something that we can all work towards. Yeah, I think uh, what we saw it, I think, with a, with a pandemic, that it was a very much of a, of a reminder, a uh, very literal reminder that we were all in this together, the extent to which we were trying to not only protect ourselves, but also protect those that we were coming into contact with and when the vaccination, although we know that there was a lot of politics involved as well, but it was part of that uh, protecting myself to also protect others uh, as well. And I think that here the, the commonality is that we're talking about individuals across the board, across a political spectrum uh, that are beneficiaries of, uh, of social security or will become in the, in the coming years across the political uh, divide, the political spectrum, across racial ethnic groups, across gender groups, sexuality groups, and so forth. So there is that commonality that, uh, that, that is an issue that, that, is, uh, that cuts across uh, different uh, uh, groups. Uh, and I think that um, the, the message and the interaction also with youth is also mm -hmm. ve very important. And I think that in, in many respects, there are certain youth that know uh, issues having to do with social security, knowing their grandparents, the struggles that they go through and so forth uh, in a, in a close-up fashion. And, uh, and then what we can do, I think, is, uh, as my colleagues here have indicated, given a number of suggestions, uh, but one is also to hold uh, uh, politicians accountable as well, making sure that they know what your issues, and if they're not going to... Call them. Call them, yeah. If they're not going to vote uh, for those issues that are... Uh, important to you, then you're not going to vote for them and you're going to find individuals who will do that. You know, we all know that all of these topics are interconnected and I'm so glad to have all three of you on this panel today to help us understand more what's at stake. But I also want people at home and here in our audience to take notice of one thing. At no point during this discussion did we discuss politics. We didn't get nasty with each other. We didn't attack. I didn't ask any of you what your political affiliations were. It doesn't matter. <laughs> It does not matter. We're Texans, we're Americans, we should all be in this together. And maybe I take this personally as someone in the media because people, uh, some people don't want to hear facts that don't, that don't suit them. But to move this conversation forward, we are going to have to have uncomfortable conversations about what we sacrifice moving forward and also try not to attack each other. So I would say <coughs> as we go home and we're on Facebook or we're online, Talk to people who disagree with you. And hopefully that conversation won't get nasty, or before it does, you step away. But the point is that, again, we're all in this together, and we're all hoping to find a solution with this. So thank you to all of you for being here today. So uh, if, you, uh, if this conversation inspired you to take action, I want you to scan the QR code on the bottom of your screen. This is for our viewers. It'll take you to a website where you can learn more about Social Security and how you can get Congress to keep Social Security fully funded. This has been a presentation by AARP and KSAT 12.